Shalom, everyone. And the Nazarim, that's what we're called. There's something for the masses to see, and then there's something for the initiated to see. It's the darkness hiding in open view. We call them Wiccans, witches, warlocks, wizards, shamans. That's what they go by. It's poison doctrine. Hello everyone, my name is Lou White. Today we're going to discuss something that's extremely important. It's about the real final solution. Uh, I've only read this once, so actually I designed it, but I'm not really uh, that familiar with these things as I go, so I'm going to use this as a kind of a teaching tool. And uh, I can see everything here that you're seeing up there. Anyway, I'd like to start today with um, a little uh, Pentecostal action, you know, speaking in tongues where we're going to use the disciples' prayer, which they usually call the Lord's Prayer, and we're going to replace some of the words with the actual Hebrew words. And you can understand them even if I don't explain what the words mean. Our Father, who is in Shamayim, Kodesh be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in Shamayim. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the honor forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Now, um, the real final solution, um, it involves our divisions. You know, we're divided from one another in a number of different ways. Uh, the Jews, who are really called the Yahudim, are divided from the Christians. And the Christians have a name that doesn't even mean anything. It, it, it's a meaningless name. It's not even, you know, a name that you would really want. It's something you wouldn't one on yourself. It's amazing because some of you don't know this, but the word Christianos, we're going to look into that a little bit too. Uh, it meant, um, you know, an idiot, you know, in the mind of the speaker in the ancient world. Now it means a follower of Christ. But we're going to use the real Hebrew words and then we'll have meaning and depth to what we're understanding. We're not going to go through Greek. We're going to actually go from English straight back to the Hebrew and articulate the real meaning it's without filtering it. Not to be angry or hateful, but we could just bypass a lot of the nonsense. Anyway, what do we look like to Yahuwah himself when we are divided? The high priestly prayer in the book of John, or Yahukanan, in chapter 17, he said that we would be kept as one in his name if we were to, keep, if we were to stay in his name. We've departed from his name and and articulated a different name. The walls have ears, they say. In this room, the real name of the Messiah is going to be spoken. And just a few blocks down the road, there's a, a building where tens of thousands of people meet every week. And the name, as far as I know, has never been uttered in those walls. Those walls have never heard this name. But we're going to say it right out loud. Do we bite and devour one another? Yeah, absolutely. And I'm not be, trying to be hateful. I'm not biting or devouring people who, who you know, don't have the knowledge. Not that I have the knowledge. I mean, it was given to me. I can't claim that I originated anything. Neither, neither can any of us. But how is Yahushua going to reunite us into one tree? We read about this in Ezekiel or Yehezkel, chapter 37. Um, the tree that he's talking about is the division of those that are in captivity, that are divided up, 
and they, we call them Jews, and they call us the uncircumcised or Gentiles. Well, the Gentiles and the Yahudim are going to be reunited and not be two trees anymore, but be one tree in his hand. That's what this little symbol means right here. Israel is the tree that is going to wind up being there. And the house of Yehuda and the house of Yisrael will be one tree in his hand. And anyway, the, the purpose of Yahushua's work, when he walked the earth and even now in his body, because see, he is Israel. He's the head of Israel, and we are his body called Yisrael. You know, we're different parts. We have fingernails and, and toes and eyes and hearts. But uh, he is all Israel. That's what he is. And he's going to reunite his body into one. And this is for the restoring of the lost tribes to the covenant. Because the covenant is not wanted or desired, but the covenant teaches love. And the uniting of all Yisrael into one stick in Yahuwah's hand is his purpose. And, it, and by doing that, we'll learn to love one another. And that's what his goal is, to love Yahuwah and for us to love one another. We can't do that if we're all divided up and the uh, heart is saying something about the toe and the brain is saying, well, the, the, the head is trying to guide the whole body, but the body's not listening to the head very often, you know. Now, in Yahukanan, or John chapter 10, we read these words. I am the good shepherd, and I know mine, and mine know me, even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And we know he did that. That's part of the message, or the besora. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, I have to bring them as well, and they shall hear my voice. That means listen to my covenant and return to my household. And there shall be one flock and one shepherd. So the, the, the Christians have a philosophy or an understanding uh, called replacement theology, where they are, the, uh, they are Israel now, and the Jews are not part of Yahuwah's chosen any longer. In fact, just recently, in the last several weeks, um, the, Christ the Catholics have come out with the statement that the Jews are no longer the chosen. Okay? <laughs> they, they don't understand. Yes, they did. And uh, that's just wrong, you know. Because, see, it's about reuniting and re restoring the lost tribes. See, even those that are in the land of Israel right now are in captivity. They don't know it. Because it, they'll be in captivity. All the world is in captivity until he returns to reunite us. Here's some seminar uh, terminology. And th these are just pieces of the restoration puzzle. The traditional terms are on the left over here. The word L-O-R-D is an English word. Nothing to really be afraid of unless you supplant his name with that word. That's a device. Yahuwah is spelled yod he u he And we're going to just use that for his name, because that is his name. Uh, J-E-S-U-S, -S, to a Hebrew-speaking person, would be Jesus, which would mean the horse. It has really a bad, strange meaning in that form. But we're going to use his real name, Yahusha, or Yahushua. Yahushua, the Shua, is based in the root Yasha, which means deliverance. And that's what he is. Functionally, he is our deliverer. Yah is our deliverer. Christos is a Greek word, and it means, now, means follower of Christ. But what it really meant, Christianos, actually meant Cretan, a Cretan, or Cretan. And if you look that word Cretan up in your dictionary, you'll see that it took the straight path through history back to Christianos. That's where it came from. The word Christianos, people have followed another path with that word. And they think it means follower of Christ. Anyway, the word G-O-D we're going to not use. That's a pagan term. Most people can look that up on the internet now and find out. Uh, the Teutonic tribes called the sun, you know, uh, by that proper name. We're going to use the Hebrew word El or Elohim. 
And instead of just calling the, tri the one royal tribe of Israel, the royal tribe, Jews, we're going to call them Yahudim, praisers of Yah or worshipers of Yah. And Yisrael is going to be understood as what it really is. And that's all the tribes that are descended from the man Yaakov, whose name was changed to Yisrael, most of whom are these descendants are unaware of who they really are. They're the prodigal son. Christians, or Christianos, are going to be referred to as what they really are originally in Acts 24, 5, from the mouth of Tertullus, who was standing before Felix, accusing Shaul, or Paul, of being a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarene. Acts 24, verse 5. If we aren't that, then we're Christians, then how could it be? You know, um, The word Nazarene we're going to look at a little closer too. It means watchmen or guardians. It also means branches, as in the meaning of descendants of, or the offspring of the teachings, like a branch and the root. You know, you get the, Yahushua is the root and we're the offspring. The Nazarene, the branches. Let's, um, let's look at one of the prophets where the word Nazarene is used briefly. Uh, Jeremiah, or Yirmiyahu, his real name, 31, verse 6. For there shall be a day when the watchmen cry on Mount Ephraim. Mount Ephraim. It's a metaphor for the nations of the, the house of Israel where they're scattered. The northern tribes. Arise and let us go up to Sion, to Yahuwah, our Elohim. Now the word watchman is Hebrew word 5341, Natsur, which means guardians, branch, protectors. Uh, Acts 24, 5, the verse itself where Tertullus is speaking to Felix says, this is Tertullus speaking. For having found this man a plague who stirs up dissension among all the Yahudim throughout the world and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarene. It's right there in your scriptures. It's been there all along. <clears throat> Many people today resist restoring the true Hebrew name. But I want you, I want you to consider one possible, possible way of looking at it. Imagine for a moment that we had been using the true Hebrew name, Yahusha, all down through the centuries. And now suddenly people are promoting the form J-E-S-U-S -S because they feel that it would be better to filter it through Greek and Latin before it's transliterated into English. Now that doesn't make any sense. Why don't we just go ahead and transliterate it through Korean and Swahili while we're at it? <laughs> doesn't make any sense. And yet that's the justification that most people go back and try to justify why they use that form. It makes no sense. Well, the real name Yahusha means Yah is our deliverer, you know. There's a meat grinder up there in case somebody need, needs to see the uh, symbolism there. Now, um, how we're set apart from the world to Yahuwah is done so through the living word, which is the Torah. Torah means instructions. And his instructions are usually ignored or excused and, you know, abandon. In 1 Peter 1, starting at verse 13, it says, Therefore, having girded up the loins of your mind, being sober, set your expectation perfectly upon the favor that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Yahushua, Messiah, as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts of your, in, in your ignorance. Instead, as the one who called you is set apart, so you also become set apart in all behavior. Because it has been written, be set apart, for I am set apart. And then in verse 22, it continues, now that you have cleansed your lives in obeying the truth, and that's the covenant of love, the Ten Commandments, through the Spirit, that's through the, the working of the Spirit, to unfeigned brotherly love, that's what it teaches us, is love. Love one another fervently with a clean heart, having been born again. That means really begotten from above. That's the real meaning of that phrase. Because we're not born yet. We're begotten. 
uh, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the living word of Elohim. Now that's spoken of by Stephen in chapter 7 of Acts. The living words that were delivered to Israel, which is the covenant. Which remains forever. Because all flesh is as grass, and all the esteem of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withers, and its flower falls away, but the word of Elohim remains forever. That's the word that was spoken at Sinai. And this is the word announced as good news to you. Now the, that phrase is a little distorted because the word in this phrase is the word rema, which means the utterances, and the word, the phrase announced as good news is the word ua galizo, which means declare to you. That's the, 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 what they call the gospel. These are the things that we're to obey. And if you haven't heard what you're supposed to obey, then you haven't heard the gospel, the message. Ephesians 4 picks up on this same idea. And he himself gave some as emissaries, or apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, those are message bearers, and some as shepherds and teachers for the perfecting of the set-apart ones. That's what we're here for today, is to get perfected, you know. Uh, not to come to a belief that he exists, but we already do that. We have to get perfected, though. Okay. Um, to the work of service, to a building up of the body of the Messiah. Now you've got that in your head. He's the head, we're the body. So the whole y Yisrael has to be like one man, one flock. Until we all come to the unity of the belief, not divided and of the knowledge of the Son of Elohim, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the completeness of the Messiah, so that we should no longer be children tossed and borne about by every wind of teaching, by the trickery of men, in cleverness to the craftiness of leading astray. That's astray from the Torah. But maintaining the, tr the truth, which is the Torah, in love. But we grow up in all respects into him who is the head, Mashiach, from whom the entire body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the working by which each part does its share, causes growth of the body. So we expand and our operation becomes more perfected for the building up of itself in love. So the objective is love. We're going to see more about that, too. Now, Ephraim, the northern tribes, that's the lead tribe, actually, of the northern ten tribes, the lost ten tribes of Israel are out in the nations. And the majority of the Yahudim, or the house of Yehuda, is also lost. They don't know who they are. But they're all out here, and they're, uh, we're all sitting together today, actually. We don't know which tribe we are. But we're all lost tribes, and we're in captivity because we're not in the land. Now, the mediator of the covenant is calling us, and here's what he wrote down for us in Deuteronomy chapter 5, Debarim chapter 5, for the last day, so that we would hear his voice. The retelling of the covenant for the lost tribes of Israel in the last days, given at Deuteronomy 5. Number one, I am Yahuwah your Elohim, who brought you out of the land of Mitzrayim, out of the house of bondage. You have no other mighty ones against my face. Number two, you do not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of which is in the heavens above, or which is in the earth beneath, or which is in the waters under the earth. You do not bow down to them, nor serve them, for I, Yahuwah, your Elohim, am a jealous El, visiting the crookedness of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing kindness to thousands to those who love me and guard my commands. The children in this phrase is the children of Israel. Number three, you do not cast the name of Yahuwah your Elohim to ruin, for Yahuwah does not leave him unpunished who casts his name to ruin. The word cast is the Hebrew word nasa, which means to throw. And the word ruin is the Hebrew word shoah, which means to utterly lay waste. They lay waste his name all the time, the translators. 
Um, number four, guard the Sabbath day to set it apart as Yahuwah your Elohim commanded you. Six days you labor and shall do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of Yahuwah your Elohim. You do not do any work, you nor your son nor your daughter nor your male servant nor your female servant nor your ox nor your donkey nor any of your cattle nor your stranger who is within your gates so that your male servant and your female servant rest as you do. And you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Mitzrayim, and that Yahuwah your Elohim brought you out from there by a strong hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore Yahuwah your Elohim commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. Number five, respect your father and your mother as Yahuwah your Elohim has commanded you, so that your days are prolonged and so that it is well with you on the soil which Yahuwah your Elohim is giving you. Number six, you do not murder. Number seven, you do not break wedlock. Number eight, you do not steal. Number nine, you do not bear false witness against your neighbor. Number ten, you do not covet your neighbor's wife, nor do you desire your neighbor's house, his field, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, his ox, nor his donkey, or whatever belongs to your neighbor. And continuing right along with that, hear, O Yisrael, Yahuwah our Elohim, Yahuwah is one, and you shall love Yahuwah your Elohim with all your heart and with all your being and with all your might. And these words, which I am commanding you today, shall be in your heart, and you shall impress them on your children, and shall speak of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up, and shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. And you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Now that's Deuteronomy or Debarim chapter 6 verses 4 through 9. Now Yisrael, uh, the lost tribes, the prodigal son, is captive among the nations and they're going to hear this covenant that I just read. And we have to love this covenant. That's why we, every time we get together we read it. In the prophet Yehezkel or Ezekiel 4 it says, then take an iron plate and set it as an iron wall between you and the city. He's laying on his side. And you shall set your face against it, and it shall be, and it shall be besieged, and you shall lay siege against it. It is a sign to the house of Yisrael. That's the, the northern tribes. And lie on your left side, and you shall put the crookedness of the house of Yisrael on it. As many days as you lie on it, you shall bear their crookedness. See, the northern tribes were taken away by the Assyrians in approximately the year 722 BCE. And you can see the map there of the, the southern tribes and the northern tribes. Now, Yehuda, the southern tribes, you know, basically just Benjamin and Yehuda, the tribes were down there. It, it, it says that they were captive for approximately uh, 390 years because he was on his side for 390 days. So it's a day for a year. Now they didn't repent. So, uh, wait a minute, this is, oh okay, okay, this is Yehuda. Because Israel was captive for 390 year, uh, years times seven because Leviticus 20, uh, chapter 26 says if they don't repent then you have to make the, 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 the curse or the judgment sevenfold. So 390 times seven. But Yehuda, the reason this says Yehuda is captive even a little bit longer is because the text here says so. You have to add 40 years to that. So while Israel, the, the, the Ephraim, the lost tribes of the ten tribes are coming back to the covenant in the nations, it'll take 40 more years for Yehuda to do it. <laughs> Ezekiel 4.6 and when you have completed them, that's the 390 days, you shall lie again on your right side and shall bear the crookedness of the house of Yehuda 40 days. A day for a year, I have laid on you a day for a year. So the house of Yehuda is going to be in captivity 2730 years from the time that northern, the northern tribes are taken into captivity. And then you have to add 40 more years for the house of Yehuda. Now that's um, a little, it takes a little bit of studying, but uh, even though they were taking, taken away in 586 BCE, uh, their, their 
linked to the, the judgment on the house of Israel. Daniel and Yehezkel, or Israel, uh, Ezekiel, in Babel, 70 years. Now Daniel was taken away as a young boy, and I believe he was made a eunuch. That's why he didn't have a wife uh, at all during his lifespan. But um, we know that Daniel was able to discern the length of time the house of Yehuda would be in captivity in Babel, Babylon, or Babel. He read the prophet Yermiyahu, or Jeremiah, in 25. And all this land shall be a ruin and a waste, and these nations shall serve the sovereign of Babel 70 years. It was very clear. And it shall be when 70 years are completed that I shall punish the sovereign of Babel and that nation, the land of the Chaldeans, for their crookedness, declares Yahuwah, and shall make it everlasting ruins. Now, the house of Israel, the ten tribes, at the time of Daniel and Yehezkel, the house of Israel had already gone into captivity. The house of Yehuda, at most, when they, the 70 years were completed, 10% of them, at most, maybe some say 5%, came back. The other 90 to 95 percent remained there and assimilated and became the nations. They became Gentiles. So all the tribes of Israel, all the tribes, are among the nations. And he's calling us back. Now, they too must repent and return to the household of faith, the Torah. Now, a final solution mathematically. Uh, we read in Leviticus, or we at 26, it declares a penalty for not repenting after receiving correction. So the 390 years, remember Ezekiel was on his side for 390 days, well, a day for a year, is multiplied by seven, making the captivity of the house of Israel 390 times seven, or 2730 years. Uh, that doesn't mean that they're going to be brought back to the land necessarily at that moment, but it means that they're, they're able to return to the covenant. So that, that happened around 2008 to 2010. You know, that's roughly where we're at. So we're starting to see it. A remnant of the house of Israel, that's the ten tribes, is now repenting among the nations. Now if we express the prophecy mathematically for the house of Yehuda. That's the two tribes in the south. It should be, or could be, 390 times 7 plus 40 years. As the remnant of the house of Israel repents among the nations, it seems likely that it would take 40 years more for the house of Yehuda to realize what is happening and become jealous of the Gentiles who are observing Yehuda's Torah. Loving obedience, that's what we do. We love to obey. And calling upon the name that they won't even pronounce yet. They're afraid of the name. Or they're afraid somebody might hear it. At the time their additional 40 years is over, that's the house of Yehuda, the prophecy at Yeshayahu 11 becomes a reality. In Yeshayahu or Isaiah 11, it says, and it shall be in that day that Yahuwah sets his hand again a second time to recover the remnant of his people who are left from Asher and from Mitzrayim and from Pathros and from Cush, from Elam and from Shinar, from Hamath and from the islands of the sea. And that would include, of course, the United States and Australia and Great Britain and the Philippines, everywhere. And he shall raise a banner for the nations and gather the outcasts of, Is of Israel and assemble the dispersed of Yehuda. See, he makes these two distinctions from the four corners of the earth. And the envy of Ephraim shall turn aside and the ad adversaries of Yehuda be cut off. Ephraim will no longer or shall not envy Yehuda, and Yehuda not trouble Ephraim. So he's going to make them one stick. They won't be divided anymore. Yisrael will then become one tree or stick. The word is etz in Hebrew in Yahuwah's hand. And the day of Yahuwah will be in full force upon the nations. So the judgment will be being poured out at this point too. In the book of John or Yehuqan in chapter 10, uh, we're repeating that same text we heard earlier. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, I have to bring them as well and they shall hear my voice. That's his covenant. 
and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. And that's, uh, we have the notes here below Ezekiel, or Yehezkel, 34, verse 23, and 37, verse 24. In the prophet Zechariah, or Zechariah 12, we read these words, In that day I make the leaders of Yehuda like a fire pot among trees, and like a torch of fire in the sheaths. And they shall consume all the peoples all around, on the right and on the left, and Jerusalem shall dwell again in her own place, in Jerusalem. And Yehuda shall save the tents of Yehuda first, so that the comeliness of the house of Daud and the comeliness of the inhabitants of Jerusalem shall not become greater than that of Yehuda. In that day, Yehuda shall shield the inhabitants of Jerusalem. He's going to use an, you know, a, a, a miracle to shield them. And the feeble among them in that day shall be like Daud. Daud was a real serious dude. And the house of Daud like Elohim like the messenger of Yahuwah before them. And it shall be in that day that I, shall, that I seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And we know that they're all poised to attack it at any second. <clears throat> Everything that can be shaken will be shaken when Yahuwah shakes the earth and the heavens. And these, uh, this man named Haman that you read about that hated the Jewish people, um, He's, his spirit is still in men. You'll see it in Adolf Hitler and Arafat and, you know, these world leaders. They, they hate the, uh, the, the, well, they hate Israel. And uh, a lot of these people are already gone. There's still a few that are still ahead of us and that remain today. And Yael, or Joel 3, we read these words. Sun and moon shall become dark, and stars shall withdraw their brightness, and Yahuwah shall roar from Sion, and give forth his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and earth shall shake. But Yahuwah shall be a refuge for his people, and a stronghold for the children of Israel. Then you shall know that I am Yahuwah your Elohim, dwelling in Sion, my set-apart mountain, and Jerusalem shall be set apart, and foreigners shall not pass through her again. Proverbs 12 says, the wrong are overthrown and are no more, but the house of the righteous stands. Yeah, where are these guys? Where is he to be found? These, these people are gone. Absolutely. Yeah, we're all one huge family. We're also a body, you know. We're, we're, he's trying to reunite us. Now, our uh, commission, our co-mission with Yahuwah is our order to teach righteousness, uh, the righteousness of Yahuwah, not the righteousness of men. In Matthew, or Matthew 28, 19 says, Therefore go and make taught ones of all the nations, immersing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the set-apart Spirit, teaching them to guard all that I have commanded you. And see, I am with you always until the end of the age. The same thing he told uh, uh, Moshe's successor. I am with you always. And uh, if you take Occam's razor's approach, in other words, distill it to its essential points and make it the most simple answer, he says, teach them the name and teach them the Torah of Yahuwah. That's what he wants us to do. That's the message. That's the gospel. Uh, it, it's, it's the main part. Of course, his atonement is also part of the message that he died because the good shepherd laid down his life for the sheep. Um, now this is a uh, pretty interesting. Love is the evidence that we follow Yahusha. Ephraim, the returning prodigal son, is learning about Torah, and it teaches us how to love. That's what Torah does. Yahusha is ultimately going to restore us from being two separate houses to be joined as one house or one tree. If we read, of course, Yeshayahu chapter 11 and Ezekiel or Yehezkel chapter 37. Now, if we as returning Israelites vex our older brother by insisting on having different observances or different interpretations, then our restoration will be impeded, or not, it won't happen, 
until we acknowledge that our older brother's experience is more important than our own arrogance. We have people that are lead sheep among Ephraim, and you all know they're on the internet, they write books, they have all these viewpoints that are different from the older brother. Well, the, the moon is a crescent. That's the beginning of the moon. That's just the way they see it. And they will not look at the way the older brother understands it. The full moon is the day of our feast. And yet they say, well, it's kind of full, even though it's one day past when they keep their festivals. Now, we have to overcome this. We have to get back together and look to the older brother. Yes. I mean, just because the older brother's doing it. He was only criticizing their leaven, the things that they added to the Torah. The leaven, the puffing up, like all these men's traditions that they did, that put the fence around the Torah. Right. So, he well, wasn't saying put a fence that, around it. I mean, we, just, we have to be careful in what we do accept of the older brother. Oh, of course. We have to re read first the word, yes. Yeah, the, they have serious additions. And how we walk is... You know, how do we follow Yahushua? Well, we walk the way he walked. We can't walk on water yet, but he was walking on water. This is just a, a little picture of how he was raising Kepha or Peter out of the water as he began to sink. In First Yehukanan, it says the one who stay in, in, in First Yehukanan two, it says the one who stay says he stays in him, ought himself also to walk even as he walked. So uh, if the Messiah didn't uh, endorse the Talmudic or oral traditions, then uh, we shouldn't pay any attention to them at all. Not to be hateful about them, but say, well, you know, that's nice that you have those, but let's just ignore those and let's move on from there and, and simplify. Not that it's uh, to be hateful, but former Gentiles is what we, I mean, we aren't really even Gentiles. We walk as Gentiles, but... The whole earth is, there's no room in the, in the coming kingdom for Gentiles. You know, there's not going to be any Gentiles. So we engraft into Israel and we are no longer Gentiles. People that meet together with the older brother and say, well, I'm a Gentile. Uh, well, you might be, but you need to become a non-Gentile so that you can engraft. In Ephesians 4, it says, therefore, having put off the false, speak truth each one with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Yehuchanan uh, 13 says, A renewed covenant I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you, that you love one another. By this shall all know that you are my taught ones, if you have love for one another. So the evidence will be seen in our attitude. So uh, we're not seeing a lot of that yet, but we will. Philippians 4 is really straight down the middle of the road for what we're talking about here. Rejoice in Yahuwah always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The master is near. Do not worry at all, but in every matter, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to, you, to Elohim. And the peace of Elohim, which surpasses all understanding, shall guard your hearts and minds through Messiah Yahushua. For the rest, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is righteous, whatever is clean, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good report, if there is any uprightness and if there is any praise, think upon these. So I guess that would probably eliminate a lot of things like Halloween. Yeah, that's gone. Uh, but you can be kind and gentle. Now... Uh, Ephesians 4 continues, Let no corrupt word come out of your mouth, but only such as is good for the use of building up, so as to impart what is pleasant to the hearers. And do not grieve the set-apart spirit of Elohim, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. His name seals us in, in our minds. Let, let all bitterness and wrath and displeasure and uproar and slander be put away from you, along with all evil, and be kind towards one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as Elohim also forgave you and Messiah. So, if we're constantly judging each other, we, we're making the wrong, we're making a horrible mistake. 
uh, our words will reveal our treasure. Matthew 12, starting at verse 35, says, The good man brings forth what is good from the good treasures of his heart, and the wicked man brings forth what is wicked from the wicked treasure. And I say to you that for every idle word men speak, they shall give an account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you shall be declared righteous, and by your words you shall be declared unrighteous. Now there's a lot of controversies out there, okay? And we have to make sure that we don't get carried away with judging and slandering. Lunar Sabbaths, new moons, festivals, food, dress, verbal battles, slander, envy, and strife. In uh, First Peter, uh, First Timothy, verse uh, chapter six, it says, "If anyone teaches differently and does not agree with the, to the sound words, those of our Master Yahushua Messiah, and to the teaching which is according to reverence, which is the, the, the covenant, he is puffed up, understanding none at all, but is sick about questionings." and verbal battles which come from uh, which produce uh, which come envy strife and slander and wicked suspicions worthless disputes of men of corrupt minds and deprived of the truth who think that reverence is a means of gain withdraw from such we know that the festivals of Yahuwah are the shadows or they're a shadow of something that's being cast by something that's real. And it's the plan of redemption. And it's not the Zodiac. But uh, if it was the Zodiac, he would have told us. You know? There are people out there writing books saying, you know what? The message is in the Zodiac. And we've not seen it. It's right there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's another one of those verbal battles. I don't want to get into that. But... Uh, Anyway, they do. Inv uh, verbal battles often involve the festivals. Uh, second, uh, Colossians 2 says, Let no one, therefore, judge you in eating or in drinking, or in respect of a festival, or a new moon, or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of what is to come for the body of Messiah. Now, the word for is a better understanding. It's the Greek word day, which means, it could mean but but it means also four, you know, it's part of the definition. And those were the seven festivals. Now there's an abundance of verbal battles. I just want to show you some of them, but we don't want to engage in any of these, but we want to be patient as we teach the, the people who are misunderstanding these things. There's people that get in verbal battles over the name of the creator. How do you say it? There's four letters. How can it be so hard? Really, there's only three letters. One of them is repeated. They get in arguments about new moons. Is it a crescent, like the Islamic people always follow, or is it a dark moon? The lunar Sabbath, which just suddenly appeared out of nowhere. It never was ever anywhere in history, and suddenly it's everywhere. Uh, when is the morning? I mean, when does the day begin? Does it begin in the morning, or does it begin in the evening? Well, it's when it, the day ends that a new day begins. It says it in Genesis or Bereshit chapter 1. Is the full moon, uh, is it the new moon or is it the full moon? Is the, you know, they don't know. See, some people think the new moon is the full moon. Uh, how to observe a Sabbath. There's a lot of arguments about that. Beards. How long do they have to be? Uh, head coverings. And tzitzith. These are the tassels that the woman touched. Remember on Yahushua that healed her? Uh, the leaven of the Pharisees, the Talmud, the oral law, what, what's to, what are we to do with it? Um, how about, the, the, recently it's been really uh, debated and disputed verbal battles over the racial makeup of who true Yisrael really is. Or alcohol and dancing, you know. There's all kinds of things. I mean, this is just a small part, of the, a few things. Now, here's a text that it advises us to overcome verbal battles so that we can become vessels of value, okay? 2 Timothy 2 says, If then anyone cleanses himself from these matters, he shall be a vessel unto value, having been set apart of, 
of good use to the master, having been prepared for every good work. And flee from the lusts of youth, but pursue righteousness, belief, love, peace, with those calling on the master out of a clean heart. But refuse foolish and stupid questions, knowing that they breed quarrels. And a servant of the master should not quarrel, but be gentle towards all able to teach, patient when wronged, in meekness instructing those who are in opposition, lest somehow Elohim gives them repentance unto a thorough knowledge of the truth, and they come to their senses, out of the, share, out of the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his desire. Because you know, one of the things that the devil wants us to do is to be divided and to be unfruitful, because we can't be fruitful if we're all divided up. And the, the longer we pursue trying to be right on details, the more we serve the devil, oddly enough. Uh, now this uh, tree over here that we've, we're kind of about to see a lot of them, in fact, they've already started to put them up in the stores, is an ornament-bound tree, and it's actually a cone of power but it's also a phallus with ornaments and tinsel. And uh, it's actually a pagan item. And it was uh, actually referred to as an A-S-H-E-R-A-H. -E and the reason that uh, people are taken captive by these snares of the devil is th because they're ignorant. They don't know what these things are. And they have to know what they are from the mind or viewpoint of Yahuwah. When he sees them, what, do what does he see? You know. People are always excusing things. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, remind them of this, earnestly witnessing before the master not to wage verbal battles, which is useless to the overthrowing of the hearers. It's not going to get you anywhere if you argue. 2 Timothy 2.16 continues and says, but keep away from profane, empty babblings, for they go on to more wickedness, and their, and their word shall eat its way like gangrene. And gangrene is going to be death and decay, particularly moral decay. In Matthew 15, we see in verse 8, this people draw near to me with their mouth, and respect me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as teachings the commands of men instead of Torah. And uh, we are very conflicted. We have all these little things that we do. We've got uh, pumpkins and garments that we wear, little costumes. And these are uh, people who are really confused. They're kind of wearing a kind of a burqa kind of affair. Um, we've got our birthdays with our cone hat. You know, the cone of power. We've got the fire. We've got the cake baked for the queen of heaven or Shamim. We go, who's this guy? <laughs> what? And then, you know, it's just, it's, it's all fertility, you know. We've supplanted it. So paganism mixed into the faith and then basically just uh, replaced it, you know. Uh, that was a uh, that was a picture of a little girl holding a little egg of chocolate. Yeah, yeah, they have that. They, they do that in the springtime. Now here's another little thing here that articles that people see talismans and uh, crosses, things like that that people wear. Uh, now we've got uh, who invented the rosary? Well, <laughs> wasn't you who it was it? No. -uh. Well, the, you see these uh, Muslim beads and these Papist beads and Buddha beads up there, you know. And uh, they're doctrines of demons is what they are. And Yahusha uh, told us to not be like the pagans and, you know, be repeating prayers. And that's what they do. So, uh, and, uh, like I, I mentioned last month, uh, the divisions between the righteous and the unrighteous are going to become more and more pronounced as, t as the end of time comes. Uh, the differences will become more pronounced. Revelation 22 says, He who does wrong, let him do more wrong. He who is filthy, let him be more filthy. He who is righteous, let him be more righteous. He who is set apart, let him be more set apart. And see, I am coming speedily, and my reward is with me to give to each according to his work. In Matthew chapter 5, 
he says, do not think that I came to destroy the Torah or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to complete. For truly I say to you, till the heaven and the earth pass away, one yod or one tittle by, uh, shall by no means pass from the Torah till all be done. Whoever then breaks one of the least of these commands, that means to set it aside or to loose it, and teaches men so, shall be called least in the reign of the heavens. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the reign of the heavens. Now, the real final solution is going to be uh, love for one another, at, at least one of the things about it. Our objectives are to be the same as those of Yahusha, to ultimately reunite Yehuda and Yisrael. That's what he, he's trying to do through us. When we wrestle and vex one another over interpretations or verbal battles, we keep our division rather than overcoming it. We have to overcome our divisions. First Yahukanen or First John 3 says, In this the children of Elohim and the children of the devil are manifest. Everyone not doing righteousness is not of Elohim, neither the one not loving his brother. Because this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another not as Cain, who was of the wicked one and killed his brother. And why did he kill him? Because his works were wicked, but those of his brother were righteous. You know, that's Cain and Abel, as uh, people understand it. In 1 Corinthians, it says, Love is patient, is kind, it does not envy, love does not boast, it is not puffed up. Do not marvel, my brothers, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. The one not loving his brother stays in death. And who is our brother? Well, it's the other Israelites, the other tribes, it's the houses, you know, the divisions. We need to love them instead of hate them. Everyone hating his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has everlasting life staying in him. In Galatians 5 it says, for the entire Torah is completed in one word, in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. If, we, if you bite and devour, and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. So Shaul's prayer was for our unity and he wanted us to understand the will of Yahuwah. That's Shaul's most important prayer. If you, if you study Shaul, you'll find that he wanted all of us to know the will of Yahuwah. Because if we don't know the will of Yahuwah, we're outcasts. We are to love one another, never judge, and remember that if they are not against Yahusha, do not forbid them. Uh, here's an example. In Mark 9, starting at verse 38, And Yehuchanan said to him, Teacher, we saw someone who does not follow us, casting out demons in your name. And we forbade him because he does not follow us. And Yahushua said, Do not forbid him, for no one who works a miracle in my name is able to readily speak evil of me. For he who is not against us is for us. So uh, private interpretations of what we might see are not valid. Private interpretations are appearing all over today based on ideas that have never been found in any place or time in all of history. People have become so confused that some believe that the full moon is the new moon. Uh, they keep the festivals out of season sometimes because they say, well, we're on the, on the bottom half of the earth and our springtime is your wintertime or your fall or autumn. And so what they do is they reverse it and they don't look at the whole planet together. Some have to dress as people did 3,000 years ago to feel set apart. Some are confused about when a day begins and ends. In 2 Peter verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 19, it says, And we have the prophetic word made more certain, which you do well to heed. What is the prophetic word? Well, it's a, it's a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture came to be of one's own interpretation. For prophecy never came by the desire of man, 
but men of Elohim spoke, being moved by the set-apart spirit. Now this is interesting over here too. The, uh, in Romans 12 it says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you prove what is that good and well-pleasing and perfect desire of Elohim. So the will of Elohim is on Paul's mind all the time. He wants us to know the will or the desire of Elohim. Now some judge one another on how we spell words. <laughs> when doctrinal divisions occur, it's usually a small number of people who focus on one issue. You know that's true. Like the new Lunar Sabbath people. They, they want you to just listen to one thing. Uh, such as the transliteration of the name, or the way we observe Yahuwah's festivals. The lunar setting of the weekly Sabbath came out of nowhere, and certainly not Yahuwah's word. And yet it has continued to grow and divide the body of Yahusha. He is ultimately going to reunite Yehuda and Yisrael. And there's no way some of these new teachings that have never existed will be accepted by the older brother. We have much to learn from the house of Yehuda, not the other way around. It's, it's only the yeast that we have be, to, be aware, to be aware of. So uh, we're not slave masters, but uh, we're learners. We're all students. Yes, sir? Could you just back up and <clears throat> the lunar setting of the weekly Sabbath came from nowhere. Could you elucidate on that? Illustrate on, uh, more on that? Think about it, why that is. Well, because uh, when you consider when the Sabbaths were being given, and the annual festivals were being uh, explained in Deuteronomy 16 and Leviticus 23, there's no mention of going according to the lunar Sabbath for setting the weekly Sabbath. The weekly Sabbaths have been a pulse ever since the creation week. See, if you go back to creation week, uh, you have six days of creation, and then the day that Yahuwah rested from his work, established the week. It wasn't, he didn't mention anything about the moon setting that. Uh, people want to read into those things. The moon was created on the fourth day, but it wasn't part of that week in, in, in terms of uh, setting the week itself. And that pulse has been seven days. In fact, every culture on the whole earth has reflected a seven day week. Chinese people, uh, apart, even if the Hebrews had wanted to change it at some point, the uh, rest of the world that were pagans would still have the seven-day week. They even reflect the name of the word Sabbath is mentioned in several dozen languages for the seventh day. Uh, sabo, sabato, sabutu. It's, it's the word itself that reveals it. Even though they weren't practitioners of Torah, these cultures inherited the seven-day week. The Romans tried to change it to a nine-day week, and they finally had to give up because it, it, it would just dissolve. Like a, it, They were trying to wound it. Satan was trying to wound the week back in the Roman days. But the wound just became engulfed by the rest of the world. I understand. Yes. Now, First uh, Peter... For, uh, chapter 5 says, therefore, as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Messiah, in other words, he saw his death, and also a sharer of the esteem that is to be revealed, I appeal to the elders among you, shepherd the flock of Elohim which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but voluntarily, not out of greed for filthy gain, but eagerly neither as being masters over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you shall receive the never-fading crown of esteem. In the same way, you younger ones, be subject, be subject to the elders, and gird yourselves with humility toward one another, for Elohim resists the proud, but gives favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, then, under the mighty hand of Elohim, so that he exalts you in due time, casting all your worry upon him, for he is concerned about you. Be sober, watch, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in the belief, knowing that the same hardships are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. 
and the Elohim of all favor who called you to his everlasting esteem by Messiah Yahushua, after you have suffered a while, himself perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. In uh, the prophet Yeshayahu 11, this is one of my favorite ones because it kind of signals the final restoration. And it shall be in that day that Yahuwah sets his hand again a second time to recover the remnant of his people who are left from Asher and from Mitzrayim and from Pathros and from Cush, from Elam and from Shinar, from Hamath and from the islands of the sea. And he shall raise a banner for the nations and gather the outcasts of Yisrael and assemble the dispersed of Yehuda from the four corners of the earth. And the envy of Ephraim shall turn aside, and the adversaries of Yehuda be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Yehuda, and Yehuda not trouble Ephraim. That's where the one stick appears. Now, the two witnesses that you read about in Revelation 11 uh, could be the two houses, you know, but it could be the two men, you know. Uh, they are the type of men they are, are El, uh, modeled after Eliyahu or Elijah and Moshe. Because Eli, Elijah or Eli, Eliyahu was given power to stop the rain in the northern area. And that's why so many people languished and they left and went to the other colonies of Israel throughout the world. Um, he stopped the rain for three and a half years. Well, the same uh, ability is given to one of the two uh, witnesses. Moshe was given the power to turn water to blood and smite the earth with plagues. Now, it says in Revelation 11, verse 6, these two witnesses possess authority to shut the heaven so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy. And they possess authority over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they wish. So uh, Eliyahu, his, Eliyahu's principal uh, message was the name of Yahuwah. His, his name actually means Yahuwah is my Elohim, you know, instead of B-A-A-L. Absolutely, yes. And that's what the two prophets, uh, the two witnesses job is, to call. That's right. If you bring them together, both, both two witnesses are doing the same work, yes. Moshe wanted them to obey the Torah. <laughs> and that's exactly what the two witnesses job is going to be. It's very good. Um, at some point, though, each one of us is individually going to stand before the throne of judgment uh, and to see if we're in or we're out. And if we're in, of course, our name will be written in the citizenry book, the book of citizenship, you know, the scroll of life. And uh, Romans 8 says, there is, there is then now no condemnation to those who are in Messiah Yahushua, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So what will condemn us? Well, Romans 2.1 says, Therefore, O man, you are without excuse. Everyone who judges, for in which you judge another, judge another, you condemn yourself, since you who judge practice the same wrongs. So we're not uh, to be critics of one another. We're to guide and gently and teach them and be kind to them. Let no one, therefore, judge you in eating or drinking, or in respect of a festival, or a new moon, or Sabbath, which are a shadow of things to come for the body of Messiah. They're shadows of the redemption plan. And of course, Christians don't know about them. They've heard the word Passover. They probably have heard the word first fruits and unleavened bread, but they don't practice those. They just have heard the words. They don't know how they fit into their lives. But they're actually a model. And it's all about the Messiah's work. He is the Passover, and he is the unleavened bread. He is the first fruits. That's the resurrection. And of course, Shabuoth is what they call Pentecost. Pentecost sounds like a Greek word. It is. Well, let's get past the Greek and look at the real word, Shabuoth, weeks. That's when the Ten Commandments were given. Wonder what that's about. Well, you know, and then the fall festivals. You know, you've got uh, booths, 
you know. You've got the day of uh, the day of the shout, Yom Teruah, the first day of the seventh month. You've got the tenth day, Yom Kafar, the day of the covering. And then you've got Sukkoth, which is the day of, of what we call tabernacles or booths. And we're going to read about that a little bit too, because it's part of the final solution. Because Yahushua is doing it all. Forgive one another. Luke 6 says, And do not judge, and you shall not be judged at all. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned at all. Forgive, and you shall be forgiven. That's like the disciples' prayer. In James, or Yaakov, 4, Brothers, do not speak against one another. He that speaks against a brother and judges his brother speaks against Torah and judges Torah. And if you judge Torah... You're not a doer of Torah, but a judge. Remember how you, were how you were deceived. This is the way deception happens. Adding to the Torah or taking away from the Torah. And the way that we're restored, and my people upon whom my name is called shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their evil ways. Then I shall hear from the heavens and forgive their sin and heal their land. That's Second Chronicles. So we renew our mind with truth and turn away from false teachings. In Malachi 4, it says, Remember the Torah of Moshe, my servant, whom I commanded, which I commanded him in Horeb for all Yisrael, laws and right rulings, See, I am sending you Eli Eliyahu the prophet before the coming of the great and awesome day of Yahuwah. And he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with utter destruction. Now, of course, the hearts of the fathers in one interpretation could be the fathers, like Abraham, Yishak, Yaakov, and Moshe. Uh, the children could be the children of Israel among the world right now, you know. And certainly it would apply to a household as well. Luke 1 says, And he shall go before him in the spirit and the power of Eliyahu to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the insight of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for Yahuwah. Now that last part is very interesting too. The disobedient, the ones not observing Torah, are going to be given insight from the righteous. They're going to hear about the Torah to make ready the bride in restoring the lost to the Torah. The hearts of the Father are those who receive the covenants and obey. And the children are Yisrael to have the same hearts as the fathers and be obedient. And those who have insight will make ready a people prepared. And this is confirmed in Daniel 12. Now at that time, and that's at the end of days, Michael shall stand up, the great head who is standing over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of distress, such as never was since there was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered everyone who is found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth wake up, some to everlasting life and some to reproaches and everlasting abhorrence. And those who have insight shall shine like the brightness of the expanse and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, hide the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall diligently search and knowledge shall increase. So he's uh, pointing out here that obviously that something is going to happen here where many are going to lead people who are without the covenant to righteousness. And that is going to wait until the end of days. So at the time of the end, the seal of the book of Daniel is going to be removed. And it's going to start happening. I think it is happening. Now the greatest of these is love. This is uh, 1 Corinthians 13. If I speak with the tongues of men and of messengers, but I do not have love, I have become as a sounding brash, brass or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophecy to know all secrets and have knowledge, all knowledge, and if I have all belief so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am none at all. And if I give out all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I give my body to be burned, but do not have love, I am not profited at all. 
Love is patient, is kind. Love does not envy, does not boast, is not puffed up, does not behave indecently, does not seek its own, is not provoked, reckons not the evil. It does not rejoice over unrighteousness, but it rejoices in the truth. It covers all, it believes all, expects all, endures all. Love never fails. And whether there be prophecies, they shall be inactive. Or tongues, they shall cease. Or knowledge, it shall be inactive. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect come, has come, that which is in part shall be inactive. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, and I thought as a child. I reasoned as a child. But, but when I became a man, I did away with childish matters. For now we see as in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. I know, now I know in part, but then I shall know as I has, have also been known. And now belief, expectation, and love remain these three. But the greatest of these is love. Now the real final solution is going to involve love because that's what's overcoming the world. Our faith, which is our belief, and our, if, we are in, or if we walk in belief, then we're learning how to love. The battlefield is in men's hearts and minds. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers in the heavenlies. It's a dimensional thing. You know, like you're tuned to an AM radio right now, but in the FM band, there's something else going on. Well we're going to be able to see that other, other channel, you know. Now Acts 1 says, but you shall receive power. This is Yahushua's final words to his Nazarene. You shall receive power when the set apart spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses. In Jerusalem and in all Yehuda and Shomeron, that's Samaria, and to the end of the earth. That's a prophecy for the last days. That hasn't happened yet. Revelation 12, 17, and the dragon was enraged with the woman, that's Israel, and, to, and went to fight with the remnant of her seed, that's her offspring, those guarding the commands of Elohim and possessing the witness of Yahushua Messiah. So they're doing two things. Galatians 5 says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, trustworthiness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such there is no Torah. Colossians 3 says, therefore as chosen ones of Elohim, set apart and beloved, but put on compassion, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, patience, bearing one another, and forgiving one another if anyone has a complaint against another. Indeed, as Messiah forgave you, so also should you. But above all these, put on love, which is a bond of the perfection. And let the peace of Elohim rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be filled with thanks. Let the word of Messiah dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. Sing with pleasure in your hearts to the Master in psalms and songs of praise and spiritual songs. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Master Yahushua, giving thanks to Elohim the Father through him. Now, one of the final solutions is found in the shadow of things to come. And we're going to talk about Sukkoth here. Let no one therefore judge you in, in eating or in drinking or in respect of a festival or a new moon, or Sabbath, which are a shadow of what is to come for the body of the Messiah. Now, booths, or tents, is the Hebrew word Sukkoth. Yahushua was born during Sukkoth, probably born on the first day and circumcised on the eighth day. Now, he will return probably at a future Sukkoth. Each year we observe Sukkoth, it is a shadow of what is to come when Yahushua rules with a rod of iron over the nations and his servants dwell in tents of immortality. So we're reminded of our bodies every time we go into it, our tent when we observe Sukkoth because a sukkah is a tent or an artificial, I mean a temporary dwelling which is what our bodies represent because the real us is our inner self that we're inside this body and it shows us that our body is a temporary dwelling because we're, it ages 
it gets sick. And that is a sign that our tent is a perishable thing. But our final solution is going to be ended by the one that can raise us from the dead and clothe us with a new tent that is imperishable. Zechariah 14, starting at verse 16, says, And it shall be that all who are left from all the Gentiles which came up against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to bow themselves to the sovereign Yahuwah of hosts and to observe the festival of booths. So they've got a training program that's going to have to go on. And it shall be that if any one of the clans of the earth does not come up to Jerusalem to bow himself to the sovereign Yahuwah of hosts, on them there is to be no rain. And if the clan of Mitzrayim does not come up and enter in, then there is no rain. On them is the plague which Yahuwah plagues the Gentiles who do not come up to observe the festival of booths, the festival of Sukkoth. This is the punishment of Mitzrayim and the punishment of all the Gentiles that did not come up to observe the festival of Sukkoth or booths. And speaking of tents in Second or yeah, Second Corinthians, chapter five, for we know that if the tent of our earthly house, that's our body, is destroyed, we have a building from Elohim, a house not made with hands, everlasting in the heavens. For indeed, in this we groan, longing to put on our dwelling, which is from the heaven, so that having put on put it on, we shall not be found naked. For indeed. We who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we wish to put it off, but, to be, but to, rather to put on the other so that what is to die might be swallowed up by life. Now he who has prepared us for this same purpose is Elohim, who has given us the spirit as a pledge of what is to come. Revelation 21 picks up on this same, same theme of booths, and I, Yehuchanan, saw the set-apart city, renewed Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from Elohim, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the heaven saying, See, or look, the booth of Elohim is with men, and he shall dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and Elohim himself shall be with them and be their Elohim. And Elohim shall wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, nor mourning, nor crying, and there shall be no more pain, for the former matters have passed away. This is the best that this, uh, this disciple could say. He saw what was going to be in the future, but he had to use human terms to describe it. At the last Yom Teruah, that's the day of the shout, the first day of the seventh moon, we read this in 1 Corinthians 15. See, I speak a secret to you. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. That's the Yom Teruah. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible has to put on incorruption, and this mortal to put on immortality. For when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall come to be the word that has been written. Death is swallowed up in overcoming. So Yehusha's work is being seen in his Nazarene. Uh, Yeshayahu 11, we read this earlier, he's going to reunite us. The vexing of Ephraim shall not uh, you know, occur, and Yehuda won't envy, uh, and so forth. But uh, Ultimately, death is going to be swallowed up. So that's a real final solution to our problem. Because we're all dying of the curse from the garden. Death is swallowed up, and Yahushua's life stops death in its tracks. Wherever he goes, he forgives sins, and he raises the dead. And a rod shall come forth from the stump of Yishi, that's uh, Daud's father, and a sprout from his roots shall bear fruit. He's talking about the sprout being the Messiah. The spirit of Yahuwah shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of Yahuwah, and shall make him breathe in the fear of Yahuwah. And he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor, 
and shall decide with straightness for the meek ones of the earth, and shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and slay the wrong with the breath of his lips. That's the first thing that happens, by the way. You know, the, he's going to gather the uh, weeds out of the midst of the righteous. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his lines, and trustworthiness the girdle of his waist. And a wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and a leopard lie down with the young goat, and the calf, and the young lion, and the fatling together, and a little child leads them. And a cow and a bear shall feed, their young ones lie down together, and a lion eats straw like an ox. And the nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole, and the weaned child shall put his hand in the adder's den. They do no evil, nor destroy in all my set-apart mountain, for the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of Yahuwah as the waters cover the sea. And in that day there shall be a root of Yeshi, standing as a banner to the people. Unto him the Gentiles shall seek, and his rest shall be esteemed. And it shall be in that day that Yahuwah sets his hand again a second time to recover the remnant of his people who are left from Asher and from Mitzrayim, from Pathros and from Cush, from Elam and from Shinar, from Hamath and from the islands of the sea. And he shall raise a banner for the nations and gather the outcasts of Israel, and assemble the dispersed of Yehuda from the four corners of the earth. And we've said this three or four times already. But the envy of Ephraim shall turn aside and the enemies of Yehuda be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Yehuda, and Yehuda not trouble Ephraim. So uh, anyway, the dragon is our constant enemy right up until the end. And who we are, not serene. That's what we are. It means something. Guardians. We're guarding the name and we're guarding the word, the covenant, the Torah. So if we guard that Torah, then we'll have the light in our lamps because we've put it in our hearts. You know, I have hidden your word in my heart. That way I will not sin against you. Now the obedient obey the commandments of Elohim. And they hold to the testimony of Yahushua. That's his bride. That's his wife. The disobedient remain lawless. And they're not engrafted into Yisrael. They call themselves Yisrael because the, the adversary is a usurper. He steals all the attributes of Yahuwah to deceive so that he can receive worship. In John or Yahukanan 8, it says, Therefore, Yahushua spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall by no means walk in darkness, but possess the light of life. I mean, what does a rabbi teach? He teaches Torah. Deuteronomy 11, verse 22 says, For if you diligently guard all these commands which I command you to do it, to love Yahuwah your Elohim, to walk in his ways, and, not, and to cling to him, then Yahuwah shall drive out all these nations before you, and you shall dispossess greater and stronger nations than you. Every place on which the sole of your foot treads is yours. From the wilderness and Lebanon, from the river, the river Euphrates, even to the western sea is your border. No man shall stand against you. Yahuwah your Elohim shall put the dread of you and the fear of you upon all the land where you tread as he has spoken to you. See, I am setting before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing when you obey the commands of Yahuwah your Elohim, which I am commanding you today. And the curse if you do not obey the commandments, uh, the commands of Yahuwah your Elohim. But turn aside from the way which I command you today to go after other mighty ones which you have not known. Now here's an interesting thing. This is really very simple. But when we're tempted or we're being led astray, we can call upon one name and we'll find ourselves in a stronghold of safety. Proverbs 18, 7 through 10 says, A fool's mouth is his ruin, and his lips are the snare of his life. The words of a slanderer are like delicacy, delicacies, and they go down into the inner parts of the heart. Also, he who is slack in his work is a brother of a master destroyer. The name of Yahuwah is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. Now, if we call upon the name of Yahuwah, which we do when we call upon the name of Yahusha, because it's in that name. He's our deliverer. 
We are advised to be in constant prayer, according to Luke 18 and Ephesians 6, taking captive every thought, okay, and captive to make it obedient to Yahusha. When we see our thoughts and actions veering into the darkness, we can call on his name and be kept from falling into sin. Running to his name is a refuge, a place of spiritual safety. Psalm 144 says, Blessed be Yahuwah my rock, who is teaching my hands for fighting, my fingers for battle, my kindness and my stronghold, my tower and my deliverer, my shield in whom I take refuge, who is subduing peoples under me. It sounds like he's putting on the armor. Uh, Colossians 10 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not fight according to the flesh. For the weapons we fight with are not fleshly, but mighty in Elohim for overthrowing strongholds, overthrowing reasonings and every high matter that exalts itself against the knowledge of Elohim, taking captive every thought to make it obedient to the Messiah, and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is complete. The name of Yahuwah is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. And it's a seal for our protection also. In, in Yahuqanan or John chapter 17 in the high priestly prayer, he's, Yahushua's praying and he says, and I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you, set apart Father, guard them in your name which you have given me, so that they might be one as we are. And Revelation 14 reflects that. And I looked and I saw a lamb standing on Mount Sion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. So the name of our owner is on us. Well, Baruch Haba B'Shem Yahuwah. Hallelujah. The abuse, the lands out, your temple, my glory and wealth. Show me, hear your heart, surrender, your new house will be home. If you, the lands out, your temple, my glory and wealth. Show me, hear your heart, surrender, your new house will be home. Your temple, my glory and will fall. Show me that your heart surrender. Your new house will be whole. Will be whole.